To understand the rise of Comcast and its impact today, we must start from the beginning with the history of internet and cable. Internet and cable derived from newspapers and magazines, radio, and the early stages of television. Each of these mediums had the goal of connecting a wider audience of people and connecting those people more quickly. By the 1970s, television had become the predominant medium by which information was relayed to people. Then, by 1980, it was utilized during the election for advertising and debates. Moreover, it brought the realities of the Vietnam War to the American living room. At this time, television was dominated by a few networks and did not provide a wide variety of content for its viewers. Due to this, the rise of the cable industry began. Richard Nixon and Ted Turner are considered the founding fathers of the cable industry. Nixon supported PBS and other cable networks in order to create competition with the existing TV networks. Additionally, Ted Turner proposed distributing his own content to local markets. From this came the first national cable networks that still exist today, such as CNN, TNT, and TBS. The creation of cable provided a better quality picture and greater selection of channels by the 1980s and 90s. It was in high demand and everyone was ultimately paying for content they were previously receiving for free. The industry was working tirelessly to build networks of subscribers by gauging the interests of specific communities, towns, and suburbs. For example, networks realized America's loyalty to specific sports teams, so they began to make that content available to viewers. Ultimately, cable took over as America's source of television. News was being broadcasted 24-7, and networks were harnessing viewers rapidly. In conjunction with cable, the internet played an important role in Comcast's history. However, it was not until the 2000s when cable and internet came together to create the technology we use today. In 1915, David Sarnoff submitted his idea for a radio music box. He believed his device would make a radio a household utility, like the phonograph, in which music, sports, and the news could be broadcast over the airways. The idea was quickly rejected as commercial folly. At the time, radio was used for naval communications, shipping, and by amateur wireless enthusiasts. The idea of entertainment radio seemed wrong-headed, if not completely whimsical. Those who rejected the idea had no way of knowing that Sarnoff's idea had successfully predicted the multi-million dollar future of radio. It was not until six years later that radio made its leap from the realm of the hobbyist and into the average home. In 1921, Sarnoff arranged for the heavyweight championship prize fight between Jack Dempsey and Georgia's Carpenter to be broadcast live. An audience of 300,000 got the first real taste of what radio could be. Sarnoff looked like a visionary. Sales soared, and the demand for radio boomed. His next epiphany, a network. Sarnoff knew that the fastest path to profits would be to create national broadcasts by straining together hundreds of stations. In 1926, Sarnoff formed the National Broadcasting Company as a subsidiary, or NBC. In 1939, Americans watched the birth of the TV era at the New York's World Fair as NBC became the first broadcasting company in the United States. Comcast, a top cable provider, made a deal to create this technology. In probably one of the most important changes to the structure of Comcast, the cable company purchased and merged with NBC Universal, which was previously owned by General Electric. The purchase of this media giant gave Comcast access to two methods of production, news through NBC, and access to the film industry through Universal Pictures. Originally, NBC's holding company was General Electric, or GE for short. In the mid-2000s, NBC Universal became a joint venture between both GE and Comcast. However, Comcast intended to buy out the rest of GE's stake of NBC over the following seven years. Ownership remained split at 51% to 49% for four years. Then, on February 12, 2013, Comcast announced its intention to complete the purchase all at once and assume 100% ownership of the company by the end of March. 
the acquisition was completed on March 19, 2013. The purchase meant that Comcast now had an avenue to work as a source of information for its audience and also as a provider of access to this information. As Crawford points out in her book, Captive Audience, the deal at face value seems to be beneficial, but there's a lot to consider in it. Americans would have almost unlimited freedom to watch a dazzling variety of football games, cooking shows, and other forms of entertainment coming from a very small number of sources. Although that was all true, the overarching problem came from control over pipes. Comcast, with this acquisition, would have even more power in its market areas to dictate the terms on which access to all kinds of information, entertainment, news, sports, data, phone conversations could be had. Crawford then goes on to point out that the problematic elements of this merger were swept under the rug through the various political contributions Comcast made to legislators or to charities that the lawmakers supported. Comcast has been paving the way for these favorable statements for years, playing it a very long game of indirect and direct political contributions. Between 2002 and 2010, it had laid out more than $9 million in direct donations to correct congressional members' campaigns and political organizations, with most of that coming during the 2008 and 2010 election cycles. However, the successful merger was also contingent on the idea of vertical integration that Crawford mentions in her book through the example of TV Everywhere, using subscription-based models in conjunction with internet access and content production. This is a way to make content a more avenue for money. Attempts at vertical integration are not always successful. Although Comcast was successful in acquiring NBC, Comcast hit a major roadblock during its expansion efforts when the cable giant attempted to merge with Time Warner Cable. The proposed merger was a $45 billion acquisition. If you take a look at this map, Time Warner, represented by the dark green shaded areas, is heavily centered on the East Coast and in urban areas like New York City, while Comcast, indicated by the pink locations, dominates the West Coast and Southern states. If you take a look at this second map, which is an analysis generated by Business Insider and WebPageFX, all of the predominant Time Warner cable areas would become areas controlled by Comcast. As a result, Comcast would become the most dominant cable and broadband provider across the country without being considered a monopoly because companies like Midcontinent, CenturyLink, and Verizon would still be the major cable providers in their respective regions. The question that needs to be answered then is why did the proposed merger fail? In order for two companies like Time Warner Cable and Comcast to merge, the federal government must approve of the merger. And in regards to the Time Warner Cable Comcast merger, the federal government did not. Despite the enormous contributions made by Comcast to both lobby politicians and support their campaigns, the Department of Justice saw a fatal flaw in this proposed acquisition. I mentioned before that Comcast would not be considered a monopoly after this merger. While that is true, the Department of Justice described the merger as making Comcast, quote, an unavoidable gatekeeper for internet-based services, end quote. Essentially, while Comcast would not technically be considered a monopoly, this merger would give Comcast so much control over providing broadband, the cable giant could be construed as a monopoly because Comcast would have the ability to block other internet-based services in the regions it controls. Bloomberg News covered the merger closely. And when Comcast announced its plan to drop the proposed merger, Bloomberg's Scarlet Foo covered this announcement as breaking news and highlighted why the FCC and Department of Justice opposed the merger. Startling announcement, although if you've been following the machinations over the last couple of days, perhaps not so, so surprising because the FCC staff have now joined lawyers at the Justice Department in uh, opposing this Time Warner cable deal. Uh, 
this Time Warner cable purchased by Comcast. Uh, this was a $45.2 billion transaction, and there are lots of deals in its wake, including uh, AT&T for DirecTV as well. But now FCC staff members are set to think that the merger would threaten competition and innovation and should be resolved or at least uh, addressed in an administrative hearing. That was a big setback. So now Com Comcast saying, forget it, where it's not worth our time uh, to pursue this Time Warner cable deal would at least uh, put the kibosh on that and allow Brian Roberts, the CEO of Comcast, to plan for his next step. While the failure to merge with Time Warner Cable was a major blow to Comcast's expansion, a new technology is also threatening Comcast's growth, and even Comcast's future, and that technology is streaming. Initially, the cable colossi downplayed the notion of a threat emerging from streaming websites. In the 2008 New York Times article, Time Warner CEO Jeffrey Bukes labeled Netflix unsustainable, claiming their $8 subscription fee wasn't high enough for the company to pay top dollar for movies or renew their deal with stars. But Netflix remained jolting cable providers into using their TV leverage to keep networks from migrating en masse to the internet, but the cord-cutting public would have none of it. Legal and illegal streaming websites are Comcast's greatest competitors as the media industry strikes forward into the future. Legal services, such as Netflix and PlayStation View, are challenging Comcast services, while illegal sites, such as Project Free TV and First Row Sports, draw younger, more tech-oriented clientele away from expensive cable plans whose prices are being driven further and further up by the cost of television rights for professional and local sports. Comcast is facing a migration of its clientele away from the cable box and towards the modem. For those that do not watch sports, cable is not an economical decision because these people could easily stream live over the web. HBO now offers their package online, separate from, from formal cable providers. Netflix now has dominant and engaging television shows that are available on their website. When asked whether they had cable packages, millennials responded that they preferred web-based television over the more conventional cable box television. As a college student, why would I invest in cable? For those who do watch sports, the idea of purchasing a limited and expensive cable package is growing more and more undesirable. Broadcasts of local network games and the occasional out-of-network game is not enticing enough for sports fans in this globalized world, with foreign sports leagues from the Premier League to niche sports like cricket. For cable subscribers, hundreds of additional dollars would need to be spent to receive the access that they could get for nothing more than their current internet subscription. We asked some avid sports fans about their sports viewing preferences. I prefer streaming sports online because it gives me the power to choose what sports I want to watch. I don't have to be beholden to whatever content Comcast uh, provides for me. I got rid of my cable and I switched to Amazon Fire because one, it's cheaper and I can look at directly on the stuff that I want to look at, which is um, mainly basketball and football. So, yeah.